Hello and welcome to another episode of Innovation Deciphered. Today we're excited to be joined by Tom Northway, founder of ZPods, an innovative provider of affordable net zero homes uh, on underutilized spaces. Uh, ZPods are a fantastic example of innovation where the business models, the material they use in construction and end product look to do something different and ultimately better than a lot of what we see in the industry. If you're interested in understanding how your organisation can better harness your ideas and transform them into valuable assets, please do get in touch. Enjoy today's episode and see you soon. Great to have you this morning uh, on another episode of Innovation Deciphered. Uh, really excited to uh, delve into uh, the world of innovation and how ZPods uh, have sat in that and evolved over the last couple of years. Um, so just to start, just to introduce everyone uh, briefly into ZPods. So ZPods are sort of affordable, zero carbon, high quality, modular housing. That's correct. Um, so it's quite a mouthful, um, yeah. but from what I've seen, um, it's a, an amazing product. Uh, and sort of really exciting to see what you've done previously and where you're going. Uh, I guess sort of first off is um, why? Uh, so as the founder of uh, ZPods, what made you look at the market? What made you think there's room for a product? And in particular that sort of niche I guess that you're looking at in um, underutilized spaces? Yeah, okay, well no, thanks for having me. and. Um... Yeah, it's an interesting part of the part of the world. So um, I've helped fund a number of businesses over over the years, uh, particularly in the renewable energy sector. And so we're going back to 2016 when ZPods first came about. Um, and I was looking at putting solar above car parks, and we came across some architects who suggested a layer of accommodation below the solar above the car park, and um, and, and utilising the airspace for, for brownfield and inner city development. And that's really where the um, the concept of ZPods came came about, and how we uh, we started our, our journey. Uh, so we worked very closely um, with um, with some key partners at, um, working with the BRE to come up with a build system uh, that could be utilised um, that sits above car parking. So we were very conscious in in the early days, and this is pre Grenfell. Um, conscious of fire, mm -hmm. fire safety, uh, obviously building in and around flammable materials and things like cars. So um, there was a lot of, lot of um, in-depth research and development to, to, to ensure that we had the right build system. So we spent uh, a good couple of years making sure that we had the right system. We removed all plastics, nasties, off-gassing materials from our, um, from our build system. And then obviously um, uh, we started building t in 2020, something something like that. So we, we perfect started, timing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and right in right in right in, that, in in the midst of of COVID, but we managed to get some products out, uh, and we've now got people living in in these these mm -hmm. properties, and we've got a lot of good post occupancy data. So um, yeah, it, it, obviously Grenfell happened in in the interim, um, and I think a lot of people are now coming to our way of thinking about what what materials building material choices that you're putting within within the buildings. So you're very conscious, not just in terms of that sustainability uh, side of things, not just the performance, making it as um, sort of airtight, energy efficient, and everything like that, but also on the sort of the embedded nature of the materials that you're using, making sure that it's not, you know, carbon intensive in the build side as well. Then very much so. So yeah, as as, as mentioned, so we're using uh, natural uh, fibre, mineral wool insulation, etc. So we're really, really conscious of what what's going into the building, uh, as well as the performance of the building. And that's like a sort of a, it's not as often you hear of people really thinking of that um, sort of full life cycle uh, when it comes to carbon. So it's great that you're looking at and still keeping the PV on the roof. Is that still there? Yeah, PV the is there, and um, and obviously we're always in innovating. Um, so we're always looking at different 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 things to put in. So we've got MVHR, the heat pumps, um, uh, in some of our. New, newer um, developments. We're looking at battery storage, etc. So there's a there's a whole raft of technology that we're we're adopting. So there's a a, a range of barriers um, that keep being put forward uh, when it comes to why innovation doesn't um, sort of take center stage uh, in in the construction industry. One of them is that sort of 
um, sort of that nimbiness that you often find, you know, not in my backyard, that's not how I've always done it. Mm. Um, building on top of car parks is not something <laughs> historically we've done. Mm. How did, you know, when you approached councils and the likes with the idea, did they sort of scoff at it? Did they think, oh, actually, that's a good use of underutilised space in my area? I think um, you know you needed you needed some um, first movers, um, and uh, our first scheme at Bristol Council in, um, was was certainly uh, uh, you know a UK first, if not mm. European first, for building um, in, in that type of airspace above above car parking. So uh, you needed you needed the right partner to get get the machine rolling. Uh, but subsequently, we've now delivered uh, or recently delivered another scheme for for uh, Bromley Council, mm -hmm. uh, which was twice as big. Um, an extra floor on top, um, and uh, again, a, a award-winning scheme. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of education that you need to, to get across, but I think that's for modular as a whole. Um, there's still a lot of pre-misconceptions of what modular is and the type of buildings that we have. So we have a show home that we take to councils, drop it in overnight, um, allow, allow people, uh, planners, um, MPs, etc., to come around and have a look at what, what, what a modular building could, could look like mm -hmm. and, and, and really could. Uh, kick the tyres, so to speak. In your experience, what do you think the uh, biggest barrier to innovation is um, in construction? Is it that this is how we've always done it? You know, it's quite an old profession, construction. There is barriers to new things. Is it the funding side of things? Is it the challenge of regulations? You know, I'm sure that's something that you've come across. There's a whole raft of building regulations. Where do you start trying to find where flexibility is in all that? I think um, I think with any innovation, there's 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 the, the old school that uh, this is how we've always built, and um, and, and frankly, it's very difficult to move. And then there's a there's office, uh, there are other parts that are um, of much more forward thinking, and and, um, and it's it's finding the right partners. We're a, a relatively small business, um, so we pick our winners and who we want to work with, um, and deliver a, a scheme uh, where Zepods is probably different to some of the other uh, modular manufacturers uh, in, in the market is that we're, we're an architecturally led practice. So in essence, we take clients from a Reba stage zero to, to de full delivery. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that early engagement piece, that education, that feasibility, uh, hand-holding exercise to get people across the line, which means that we can deliver a project that they, they've bought into uh, rather than just turning up with a with a, a solution. Yeah, so you've got the, the doors already slightly open rather than trying to persuade someone that there's a better way of doing things. You've Correct. already sort of uh, got people who are open-minded in the first place. Very much so. And I think you're certainly seeing it um, in, in London, uh, a push for uh, sort of urban densification. Um, so you've got yourself, you've got, um, is it Pocket Life, is that what they call the uh, another sort of off-site manufacturer who are looking at small areas that you can do. Are you seeing that as a as a drive for looking at innovative new ways of building houses in Bristol and other cities as well? Yeah I think well obviously brownfield sites are, are, are an important asset uh, and potentially under, underutilized and I'll give you a case in point we've, we've recently got planning for a scheme for uh, down in Ashford for Ashford Council. This is a flood zone three so mm. land that's potentially discounted down <laughs> to zero um, and um, you know through innovation and the right partners, we managed to get a, um, a planning approval um, approved by the Environmental Agency to build above a flood zone three. So, mm -hmm. so we're, we're able to unlock land that traditionally has not been utilised. And uh, I think this is, this is where we should be focusing our, our attention at the moment. Yeah, no, certainly I guess the, the principle of above a car park can be above anything Correct. in many ways um, that historically would have stopped, stopped things happening. That's good, that's interesting. And um, I mean, a lot of, um, I mean, do you class yourself as a sort of construction company, a almost a, a tech startup or, or something else? Where, where do you class yourself and how did you find that sort of initial sort of coming to the market and trying to raise funding Initially, did you get a lot of oh, construction? No, thank you. I think um, I think it, we we wear multiple hats. Um, so so we act as principal contractor. We act as architects, designers, um, and we manage uh, the 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 uh, manufacturing element within other people's factories. Um, so um, so we're a multidisciplined company, uh, and which could be 
described as a, a construction business as 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 well. So so in essence, um, you know, fundraising was um, uh, we we used an enterprise initiative scheme EIS uh, to to raise our capital, um, and this was in 2016 2017. We haven't had to raise any further funds since. So the business is solid in that <laughs> respect. Um, our turnover is, has has um, uh, doubled over the last last year, um, and we're we're very comfortable in, in, in our cash position. So uh, I think the company is 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 well um, well funded in that respect. There was certainly I think a a pre pandemic um, uh, with things like the Pharma Report and things like that. There was a, a real sort of our oh, MMC was starting to. Uh, gain a lot of traction people were starting to open their eyes to the different um, approaches there does seem to be a little sort of uh, increase in the uncertainty around the market we've seen a lot of uh, companies unfortunately disappear recently do you think there is a fundamental change in where the market is and going or is it still a positive outlook for increased growth in MMC in construction I think from our perspective we've we've Come at, at this from a slightly different angle. So, um, not owning a factory for 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 our initial period was uh, was the right decision mm -hmm. to, to to do. Uh, having that big overhead and not having sufficient pipeline within within your business uh, means that you're, you're you're destined to fail and fall over. And I think we've we've seen that in in the market. Um, you know, we're now in contract from a planning or and or rolling into into full contracts with over twenty local authorities. Uh, we've got a substantial pipeline of 800 plus units. Um, you know, it, we're in a, a much better place than we probably would have been if we had um, had that huge overhead of mm -hmm. having a big factory. Oh, that's good. So yeah, you're right. That sort of slightly different approach to entry has given you uh, greater flexibility Very nice, in yeah. being reactive uh, to to market changes. You've uh, you mentioned uh, before the post occupancy data. Yeah. Uh, that you've got a lot of good stuff. Is that both in terms of performance of the units and how people are enjoying, or is it more one or the other? Yeah, so there's a recent report which can be downloaded off our website, which is um, uh, Commonwealth Housing, University of West of England, uh, looking at the performance of our, our scheme at Hope Rise in Bristol. And yeah, so it's looking at the performance of the buildings. Did they, they do exactly what they should be doing? And we got a, a resounding tick on that. But it's also that social impact and how, how mm -hmm. people's lives have been changed living within those buildings so it's the the, the whole of life within within the uh, the actual building system uh, you must be um sort of proud of being able to because one of the things as well is that they're affordable housing so you are as a as a company reutilizing space uh and helping what could be classed as sort of underprivileged areas and the like. That must make you proud to be able to see the social think, impact that you have. Uh, the, the social impact is 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 really uh, demonstrably measurable in respect of what we're what we're building. Um, a majority of our contracts and our, our homes that we're building are, are social rent, mm. um, so not just affordable. Uh, I would say about 90-95 percent of that. And, and certainly, um, working with local local authorities, they can see the benefit of a building like ours uh, for that particular cohort. Um, they generate more energy than they consume. They're, they're designed for people that are cash and energy poor. In this current market environment, um, it ticks ticks those boxes. Uh, a huge education to get local authorities across the line to to buy into that concept because uh, you know these buildings are more expensive um to 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 actually implement <laughs> but they are better for the end user and and, and that's the um that's the benefit when, when you say um the units are more expensive mm. I, I can understand that more from a upfront capital perspective which you often see mm. with mmc but the whole life uh, business case is always as good if not better than traditional models and um, I guess that's something that again is an educational piece for uh, for councils and funders to be able to look past capital. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agreed, and um, I think it's it's your material choices, the mm. the the, uh, the life expectancy of those 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 material choices. You know, for example, if you're treble glazed timber frame, how you look at windows with an eighty year design life versus some PVC windows that you have to change every twenty years. So it's you know, are you are you uh, getting the whole of life? Um, benefits from from investing yeah. in the building. I think you're right. Yeah, I think there is a, a shift in funding in general to have a sort of a green focus. I mean, people are 
uh, willing, able and wanting to fund green initiatives more than traditional builds. So if, like being able to demonstrate that net zero and um, the, the, the positive approach to the material choices that you can, I'm sure ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of people out there. Yeah, very much so. I think the whole market is, is moving slowly towards that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, you know, Zepcos has, has been there since 2016 and that's all we've built. So we haven't changed our, our, our mindset and our mentality from the get-go. So we've seen the market come around to our way of thinking, uh, which is a good thing to see. And hence the fact that we, we're beginning to, to get a lot of traction in, uh, from local authorities, re registered providers, etc. that are genuinely looking for a net zero building. Hmm. Do you think there's ever, because obviously when we talk about sort of net zero UK, um, one of the biggest barriers is the existing housing stock. Do you think there's an opportunity for Zpos to look at retrofit at any point? Um, very difficult to do, not for us. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> an easy question to answer. I didn't think there was, but yeah. you never know. Yeah. You never know. I thought I'd get a snippet of a secret from you. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we are doing some rooftop schemes, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and so we're, we're, we're improving the, the fabric of a building, in, insulating roofs, etc. But uh, yeah, the top will be at zero, the rest of it will, will be a traditional building. Yeah, yeah no, I think there is definitely an opportunity for someone out there to, you know, the retrofit market is potentially massive. If It, um, it, it is, yeah, but it's also very difficult. Oh, it, yeah, gotcha. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And also, I think, um, as well, a slight tangent away from Z-Pods, mm. um, but the, um, the issue with retrofit is not just making the building, but also the educational piece. Um, I can't remember who it was, but someone did retrofit um, a, a row of terraced houses, I want to say somewhere like Nottingham, um, but they had an issue with the energy consumption of one house because um, the occupants kept leaving every window and door open, so it just ruined any, just because that was, he was used to having to do. Yeah. It's a big um, education piece required with understanding. Do you have any of that with your occupants, helping yeah, them so understand how to maximise the efficiency of So with any of our buildings, there's a, it comes with a user manual, um, and so we, we can give guidance on, on, on how the building should work and how you can ma maximise the efficiency of the building. But you, as you say, you can't stop someone leaving their windows open and sat on their balcony in, yeah. in the freezing cold with the heating on. So, so it's a, it's a, uh, it, it is an educational piece. But as people begin to, to work with the building, they can see the benefits because they can see their energy bills going down uh, considerably yeah. if, if you're using it in the right way. Uh, what does the future hold for Z-Pods? Well, they, they, um, the future the future's, uh, it, it's, it's bright in that respect. We're going in the right direction. Um, as, I, as I said, we've got a, a demonstrable pipeline of business that we need to, to get, get built. We've got some very innovative schemes in flood zones, etc. Um, our first rooftop schemes are being, being um, uh, going through planning and, and, get, and going to get built this year. So we've got a, a huge evolution of, on, on where we're going and, and, and type of projects that, that, that we're building. So uh, yeah, there's lots, lots, to, lots to keep your eye on. That's good. And if you, um, so any sort of uh, budding entrepreneurs who are out there listening uh, or watching today's podcast, if someone out there with a good idea, what would be sort of your snippet of advice that you'd give them to try and turn that into something uh, sort of tangible like you've done with Zpods? I think the key thing is to, is to ensure that you've got the right people around you and the right knowledge and, uh, and understanding, incentivise the people uh, that work with you um, and, and drive that idea forward. So you just need to uh, believe in it and get other people to believe in it. Fantastic. Um, well, we'll um, sort of finish it off there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, sort of, uh, it's been interesting to uh, see uh, where Zpods have been and come from the last couple of years. Uh, and I'm really excited to uh, sort of watch you uh, grow and evolve into whatever you become uh, next. Uh, so good luck. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Awesome.